Hello, Garland Nixon here. It's Friday morning and I'm hanging out with Jody Brar. and I suspect that we're going to learn something very important. Let's talk. Good morning, Garland here. I'm here with Jody Brar, and as you already know, she's brilliant. And I'm going to take the, uh, the I, I'm going to, I'm going to use the Casey Stingle vision of being a genius today. So I'll call myself a genius for this reason. He was a, uh, he was a, Casey Stingle was a, um, the manager of the New York Yankees when they had these great names, you know, that will never be forgotten in the, in the annals of, of baseball. They, they hit home runs, they won World Series, and someone once referred to him as a genius. And he said, do you know what the definition of a genius is if you're a baseball manager? And they said, no. He said, taking credits for all the home runs that somebody else hit. So today, I'm on with Jody Barr, so I can claim in the vision of, Jay, uh, of Casey Stingle to be a genius. All right. Jody Brar is she is the chair of the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist Leninist, and a great friend of the show. And we have a lot of fun uh, learning lots of stuff from Jody Brar. I love to learn. All right, Jody, let's start here. Notwithstanding any critique of uh, Galloway's movement, his party, whatever the case may be, the reaction of the ruling elite when they lost, and the fact that, of the matter is. They, someone ran who wasn't a Tory, who wasn't Labour, and this person got more votes than both parties and another independent combined. And Rishi Sunak looked like his hair was on fire. Um, the, the, the horror, the, no, let me add one other thing to this. Emmanuel Macron, he's over in um, France. I mean, he's looking cartoonishly horrified. Kind of like when I was a kid, they'd have these cartoons and someone would be frightened and they'd go running with their both hands up in the air and they would run through a wall and there would be like a cutout of the person with both arms sticking out there in the wall. That's what Macron looks like as far as what's happening, as far as the fate of imperialism in Ukraine right now. Your thoughts on the um, reactions of the ruling elite to um, the people, the masses getting sick and tired of their... Um, evil doings, Jody. I mean, you're describing there the um, the the um, visual uh, translation of that phrase, uh, his hair stood on end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I think we can say when we look at the ruling class, that's perfectly apt. I think their hair is standing on end. You know, we've seen throughout the development of this Palestine solidarity movement, a real fear amongst the ruling class that they have lost control of the narrative in a way that is unprecedented. And it's a it's a thing, you know, I'm sure I've said this before, but, you know, in Marxism, we talk about in philosophical terms, but, it, it, you know, in nature, we see it everywhere, the way that uh, quantity transforms into quality. So we've been seeing for a long time little quantitative changes in the attitudes and the level of understanding of the masses when it comes to how they feel about the state, the politicians, the media, the things that hold up the pillars of the rule of the capitalist oligarch clique, right? Um, we've seen things adding to that, that uh, awareness of the pillars of rule and how they operate, as opposed to how we're told they operate, and a growing disenfranchisement and disconnect of growing numbers of people. Um, but there's definitely a sense in which the, the Palestinian resistance operation of 7th of October, which in itself, I think, was, was sort of made possible by the ongoing victorious SMO by Russia in Ukraine against NATO, right? That, that has flipped something. Uh, it's like, you know, we had all these little changes and then quantitative accumulation of changes transformed into a qualitative change. 
So this is something you see in all kinds of phenomena and you see it in social life as well. Quantity transforms into quality and suddenly it's like we're in a different reality, you know, and it was just one little thing that tipped you over the edge from lots of little things to a big change. And it feels like a big change moment has come with the, with the, um, the genocide in Gaza, essentially Israel's response to the Palestinian resistance operation of 7th of October. And that resistance operation basically says, we're not going away. We are not going to be quietly genocided. We are not going to lie down while you get rid of us step by step, inch by inch, farm by farm, olive grove by olive grove, school by school, mosque by mosque, you know, tower block by tower block, you know, mowing the grass every couple of years and to keep them to keep up numbers in check and steadily eroding the territory on which we live and steadily tightening our belt on the rations that you send in to Gaza. And we are not going to just sit here forever. Right. So that was what 7th of October said. And the response of Israel was their hair stood on end. They were terrified and shocked. It upended all of their plans. Um, and their response conducted in the full glare of global publicity has horrified the world, but also forced a whole lot of people to wake up to the reality that they had allowed themselves not to see for a long time. You know, they allowed themselves to be lulled by the official discourse of a very complicated issue, it's very historical, you can't really get to grips with it. But fundamentally, the solution, you know, there's a problem between Muslims and Jews, they're always fighting each other. But fundamentally, uh, what we need is two states next to each other, one ethnically Palestinian, one of them ethnically Jewish, if you could, if there's such a thing. But, you know, we're presented as that is such a thing, right? A Jewish state and a Palestinian state on the territory of historic Palestine is the answer, is the answer, is the answer. We've been told, like, you know, ever since Israel created the problem uh, in 1947-48. Um, they upended, with their behaviour, with their response, the Israelis upended the narrative and woke up a hell of a lot of people. And the social media impact you know, the impact of seeing for so many people seeing on their phones right in front of their face, video after video of the bombings of, of Palestinian people and you know, civilians and civilian infra infrastructure, the, the, the pictures of the absolutely raised, you know, uh, uh, geography, skylines, you know, cities, towns, everything of Gaza, infrastructure. Um, the footage of Israeli soldiers and their attitudes, the footage of Israeli leaders and their pronouncements and their exhortations to the masses to go out to the Israeli soldiers, to the Israeli settlers, to wipe out every Palestinian because they're in the way of our great project, you know, has become so blatant and so vile and so obvious and undeniable that then the imperialist insistence on sticking to the script that Israel's democracy in the Middle East, that Israel has the right to defend itself, that we can't call for a ceasefire because Israel's facing an existential threat. <laughs> and that even when they say, oh yes, we need to uh, get some more aid into the Palestinians, you know, under pressure, they say things like, oh, we need to send more, more aid to Palestinians. Oh, we need there to be a, temporary pause for humanitarian efforts right because we really care about people you see anthony blinken well we really you know it, it, it's heart-wrenching for us to see these palestinians suffering but they're sending three plane loads that's just america never mind britain and the rest of europe three plane loads full of bombs every single day without asking congress in case there's an argument right? um that's the truth and this truth is being is being pushed onto the consciousness of an increasing number of people. Now, of course, there's still a lot of people who are totally oblivious and living their lives like nothing's happening. You know, that's, that's a sad fact of the world that we live in. But for the people who are becoming plugged in, they can't look away. And the facts are just piling up. And the insistence on our, of our rulers on sticking to their old narratives, 
and assuming that they can use their media to make those narratives look like they're the truth uh, has just exposed the leaders. Keir Starmer, Rishi Sunak, you know, have exposed themselves as facilitators of, backers of, directors of horrific crimes. The most horrific crime of genocide going on right in front of us. And they have made it really, really clear they're on the side of that genocide. So there's a large section of the population in Britain which really cannot stomach that, which is growing, you know, ever more um, sickened and angry and, and frustrated that they don't feel like they can't work out what their mechanism is for doing something. You know, like we sat there and watched the ICJ ruling and said, OK, is something going to happen now? No, no, because the USA actually owns the UN and all the bits of the UN that look like they might do something independent. In the end, they can only act on it if the Americans say they can. Look what happened to the refugee agency. They closed it down. So that was a bit that was looking a bit independent. They funded it all this time because it's a fig leaf for their activity. But they decided they didn't want it anymore. They found an excuse and closed it down. Did, did refugees suddenly not matter anymore? Like, and they, they, you know, the excuse was so spurious, wasn't it? But you know, so we see that all these official mechanisms, like we talked about last time about the rules and who are they really for? You know, these officially, the UN has all these mechanisms for upholding the international system and solving problems between nations. And but Israel has always been exempt from every mechanism of the UN, and it is continuing to be. And that is also shocking people into realization of what the UN really is, you know, which as I said before, you know, my father long ago, you know, coined uh, the expression for the UN that it had become the colonial office of, of the USA. Uh, and that is what we see. It does PR to make it look like it's for, you know, to uphold the balance and, of, of, of power and, 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 and good relations between nations, no matter what their size and all these kind of myths. But the reality is, you know, with the decline uh, in uh, power and influence of the Soviet Union, it's totally controlled by the USA to all effective means, anything that meaningfully can be done with the with the UN has to be has to have the blessing of the USA or it can't carry on. Um, and that's that's something else we've discovered. So there's this and I've got off on one, but you know, the, we've had this realization and this and this growing sense of frustration of what the hell can we do? People want to do something. They want something to change. They can't bear to feel complicit. I mean, we saw Aaron Bushnell saying, you know, what, what, what would you do if you've ever wondered what would you do when a genocide was happening? You're doing it. right? And there's people who feel that, like Aaron Bushnell felt it, like we're doing it. What are we doing? We're doing it. <laughs> we're doing nothing. And they want to do something and they feel frustrated that, you know, we've seen this regular appearance on our streets of demonstrations and they're and they're big and they're not just Muslim and they're not like Islamists, you know, the, the huge numbers of people, lots of families who just care, who just really want genocide to stop, and who are angry about the fact that nobody's listening to them. And already before George Galloway won the by-election in Rochdale, there was a growing movement amongst uh the 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 ruling class and their you know ideologues in the press these growing trend of commentaries saying putting out this idea that the protest movement has gone far enough and the protesters need now to go home because they have to coin a phrase made their point so what we're being told by this is democracy is you're allowed to say something you're not allowed to influence an outcome. I mean, we saw our parliamentarians refusing to uh, vote on a motion for a ceasefire because in that motion, it said, what did it say? It said something about um, Israel having some culpability and Labour couldn't sign up to that. And so they tore up the rules and precedents of Parliament in order to replace the motion that was supposed to be voted on with one that Labour felt happy to vote for, i.e., which says nothing. And then they duly voted for it. 
And, you know, Parliament went into a meltdown because the rules had been thrown out. And obviously the opponents of Labour, you know, felt they had to make a fuss. But fundamentally, they're all basically happy with that because, you know, they're coming under pressure from their constituents. People who are angry are writing to their MPs and saying, this is not OK. So people in Parliament are feeling that pressure. Uh, and then now they can all say, oh, well, you know, we voted for the ceasefire motion. And, you know, if they're, if they're Labour, they'll say, well, we want a ceasefire. And if they're the others, they'll say, well, we would have voted for the other one. Labour, It was Labour's fault. You know, and everybody can blame everybody else. But the fact is that, you know, they're all, you know, in bed with the system. And British imperialism demands loyalty to Israel. If you want to be in the government, you must be loyal to the Zionist project. Um, and we'll come back to this whole tail wags the dog thing. So remind me later. I don't want to go off on that now. Um, but so we have a whole parliament that's really subservient to this agenda. And I think the, the opportunity that was presented to people by the Rochdale by-election and by George Galloway in particular standing there, you know, it's not just that there's a strong anti-war contingent population there, many of them. Muslim, but I'm sure not all. Um, it's not just that the genocide is happening right now and people are angry and frustrated and feel that they've got no way to express that. It's also that George is somebody who has done this before. George twice won by-elections on an anti-war ticket. George is one of the, probably the only well-known national politician in Britain who has consistently actively opposed the wars uh, of British imperialism to the extent of he got kicked out of the Labour Party um, for having done so uh, in the time of the Iraq war. So he's, and you know, he's been well known as somebody who's acted on behalf of Palestine in solid, you know, opposed the wars. Um, and so when he turns up in Rochdale in this moment, now, because of what's happening in Gaza, there are Muslim Labour Party MPs and councillors also coming under lots of pressure. And this is creating another little section of turmoil in the in the Labour Party, because this is part of what happened in Rochdale. The Labour Party candidate had been disciplined and deselected by the Labour Party because he said something about October the 7th, which they didn't like. I think he said a kind of conspiracy thing, which was Israel let it happen so they could have an excuse for carrying out their genocide. So and there's a, there are some people who, who think that way personally. I think it's just, it's just this is the kind of thing that people say who can't believe that the oppressed can ever be cleverer than the oppressors. I don't, I don't buy into that. I don't see why the Palestinians couldn't have done it. The Lebanese showed that they had a very good understanding of uh, Israeli uh, military and security uh, apparatus. I don't see why the Palestinians in Gaza wouldn't also have, have worked that sort of thing out. Uh, over these, you know, last 17 years. So he said that he got disciplined, deselected. So they've got chaos amongst their own kind of Muslim uh, figureheads. Um, and so Labour didn't officially have a candidate. Then they brought someone in last minute, but the, but the guy they deselected stood as an independent. So, you know, they were in chaos. And they rely very heavily in working class areas. Labour relies very heavily on Muslim votes because amongst poor British people, the poor white working class are disproportionately represented amongst those who just have given up with voting. They've basically gone, what's the point? It's the same, whatever we do. Um, you're more likely to find amongst poor Muslim communities that they're still voting, despite the fact of continual betrayals. They're still sort of feeling that there's some reason they should they should hope and and believe in the in the lies of the various candidates, including Muslim Labour candidates who stand and tell them that if you let me, things are going to be better. Of course, they're not. They're going to be the same because Muslim, Christian, white, brown. If you stand for one of the main parties, you're standing for British imperialism. Um, but Nevertheless, Labour relies heavily for on the Muslim community for votes uh, amongst working class people. Because as I say, lots of the lots of the poor white working class people have stopped voting. Um, 
But they are, of course, the community which is especially disproportionately plugged into what is happening in Gaza and Palestine and hugely disgusted. I mean, I think as many as 100 Labour Party councillors, you know, in local town councils have resigned, resigned from their jobs as councillors and resigned from the Labour Party across the country because of Labour's position on Gaza and they just can't stomach it. These are fairly low level Labour people. It's not made a big thing of in the news every now and again. If you look in the right place, you'll see your three councillors in Oxford resigned, the two councillors over here resigned. But if you add it all up, it's between, I think, 50 and 100. There's been a lot of them. And I'm sure there will continue to be more because it's, you know, as a Muslim, you know, in a Muslim community to keep standing with Labour while they keep standing with genocide is, you know, harder every single day, isn't it? It's bound to be. Uh, how do you retain the slightest shred of credibility and how do you, you know, just placate your conscience? Because you know about it. You're part of a community that is plugged in. You can't pretend that you don't know because you definitely do. Because, you know, your constituents and your friends and your, they'll all be telling you about it and showing you. Um, so it was a... A, a, a kind of combination of circumstances. You know, we've seen huge numbers of white working class people because of the economic conditions, because of the betrayals of all the parties, they have given up on the electoral system. Um, and we saw with this ele uh, election, the voter turnout was really low. Um, it was less than 40%. I think only a little bit less than, but so if we say 40%, you know, it was low. Um, but what was really significant was the way that George successfully turned it into a referendum on Gaza. And the answer was stunningly clear. I mean, by-elections can often be used as a protest vote, a protest vote against an unpopular government, a protest vote against an unpopular sitting politician. But what was really interesting here was both the unpopular government, that's the Tories, and the unpopular locals, the Labour Party got trounced. All three main parties, Tory, Labour, Lib Dem, put together got 27% of the vote. And George Galloway got 40% of the vote. And the runner up to George Galloway was a local guy who has never done anything political in his life and decided that they needed a local candidate like just when they announced the election went, mm, I think I should have a go. And he got the next number of votes after George. Uh, and he was running on a ticket that was just talking about local services. Uh, and normally people like that, they don't get a look in in the media. They don't get any traction. You know, it's very difficult to cut through. It's the same problem, you know, that George has had in national elections. You know, no matter how principled your campaign, no matter how it how it plugs into and touches the 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 core the nerve of things that people really care about no matter how good um the things are you want to talk to them about the truth is that a national election is very much controlled by the national media and a national narrative and people either don't vote or they feel that there's no point voting for anything other than tory and labor um you know in the main, because you know we have this understanding that, you, or maybe Lib Dem because they're in a better position to beat or not beat the the ones you want to get in or not get in. You know, so if you if you want Labour to get in, you'll be looking at how to beat the Tory nearby you. You know, and people sort of think like that. And if you want the Tories to get in, you'll be looking at you know um, how to beat Labour in your local seat. So that might sometimes mean voting Lib Dem, <laughs> but you know, fundamentally, people don't at a national election. They don't really vote according to their real beliefs. You know, we have this first past the post system. And so, you know, there's a national narrative that's very, very hard to break through. You don't you can't get press for a or media coverage for a local campaign. And 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 the, and the mindset people have is one or two big local uh, uh, national issues. And, they'll, and then they're very much focused on that if they're voting at all. And of course, voter turnout for all elections in Britain is steadily, steadily declining. And I'm pretty sure we'll continue that way for quite some time to come. You know, the, the mass has simply given up on the idea there's anything to be got from electoral politics and they're mainly right, you know. But what's really, I think, fascinating to see is how, because George really can put a spanner in the works when it comes to exposing the shenanigans in parliament, 
demanding real debates on, on uh, real debates on questions connected with the genocide in Gaza and forcing all these bastards, 650 of them in parliament, 649, <laughs> to show where they stand, either by avoiding the debate or by, you know, arguing with perfectly reasonable points that George, I'm sure, will put forward in his inimical style, then they don't want to have to face that. They're very aware that this is a this is something that's starting to spin out of control. And I I read uh, Sunak's speech in two ways. Number one, panic, total panic, and a desire to um, boost the narrative that they've already been trying to build, but I don't think very successfully yet. But they wanted to, you know, with a special announcement, boost the narrative that the Palestine solidarity movement is something to do with Islamist extremism and anti-democratic. And that the people who are demonstrating are taking over our streets. Right? They're not trying to influence democracy in the way that they're told is the right way, right? When we've been told that peaceful protest is part of our democracy and it's one of our ways for influencing outcomes. No, 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 it's not. You're not allowed to try and influence outcomes. They're actually trying to build a narrative now that says MPs are under attack. MPs are painting themselves. Our politicians are painting themselves. Get this for obscene hypocrisy. They're painting themselves as victims. They're saying, this is terrible. We're just trying to do our job here. And these people are threatening us and making us feel unsafe. How awful. So <laughs> rather than listening to the substance of why it is lots of their constituents are angry, you are facilitating genocide. There are real victims in Gaza every day. I mean, what, something like 135 children every single day have died in Gaza since Israel started its uh, campaign. That's just the children, just little kids, right? 135 every single day. More than 30,000, probably 35,000 by now, and particularly if you, if you include the people who were lost under the rubble, killed overall. Civilians, it's not a war. It's a wipeout of civilians and their homes and their everything about their lives, right? Um, the whole of Gaza essentially razed to the ground and people being massacred when they queue up for food, for God's sake, right? So people who are, who are aware of these crimes are angry and they are contacting their MPs, which is what we're told we're supposed to do in a democracy and letting them know that being complicit with these crimes is not okay with me. And now the politicians, because they can't deal with these conversations, are turning around and saying, the atmosphere is getting too heated. These, these extremists are threatening our safety. We are the victims. We politicians who send the bombs to Israel every day and give democratic cover for this operation. We are the victims. And the protesters who are trying to prevent a genocide are extremist criminals. And so on the one hand, Rishi Sunak's speech was really trying to boost this narrative and create a divide in the population between those who are plugged in to what's happening and angry about it and those who have not yet understood what's happening. And they're very much trying to promote a narrative that says to those people who haven't yet understood, those people who are protesting are crazy extremists who are hijacking your streets right? Not that this is something you should all care about, but they're, they're different to you. They're extremist lunatics and they're taking over your streets and they're definitely trying to play on that narrative and divide the workers amongst, amongst themselves. The other thing I thought that Rishi Sunak's speech was doing was preparing us for a new round and I presume they're going to try and, you know, accelerate it through Parliament once they've worked out what it is they want to do of um, legislation. Uh, uh, police powers or just a, a new interpretation of the police powers we already have, a new regime for policing or allowing or not allowing demonstrations and speech and all the rest of it. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. Let me ask you this. If you could discuss, you know, one of the things that has happened, particularly in Gaza, 
is, and and Ukraine, but particularly in Gaza, is it it, the, it is exposed the liberal class, right? In in the United States, we used to have uh, I haven't seen them, but we had these advertisements. You know, they couldn't get enough people to join the Navy, and it would say the U.S. Navy, a force for good, right? Um, and what we would constantly see from the um, imperialist is, you know, because if let's face it, if they just said to the citizens, hey, look. We're going around the world. Uh, we want to steal a lot of people's stuff. We're probably going to have to kill a lot of people, bomb a lot of people, overthrow countries, and then we'll ultimately steal all of their stuff, right? The, you know, most citizens would say, yeah, that's what I can't get on board with that. That doesn't sound good. So instead, they say, we're bringing democracy, we're helping, we're doing wonderful things, good things. Yeah, hooray, 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 right? And a lot of people were bamboozled by it. However, particularly Gaza, somewhat in Ukraine, has opened the eyes. Uh, to a lot of people who consider, even people who consider themselves part of this liberal class have looked and like, my God, what are my compatriots, what are they doing? And it has opened the eyes of many to the reality of the so-called liberal class. You know, academics, professors, lawyers and doctors, all of these, you know, the white collar people, the educated, you know, class, right? But yet, you know, for all of the goodness and wonderfuls and they're they're into getting they get their dogs from the um, rescue shelters and all these things that show how good they are. And they're being exposed. Talk about these people so we'll understand who they are and how the, 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 the process of them being exposed, what that means, the liberal class that, you know, it, it, really con to me they consider this uh, themselves an intricate part of the ruling elite but at any rate go ahead these li these liberals being exposed talk about that so uh from my perspective the people you're talking about come from a variety of sort of, of classes if you like but they all form a a bribed upper layer in society who have a vested interest in maintaining the system because it's the system uh, as it is, it's imperialism which pays for their privilege. It's, it's the loot of the empire which assures them a better life than the average worker. And there's, so there's really, essentially, we're talking about what Lenin described as the labor aristocracy. These are people who might work for a salary, but it's a very elevated salary. It enables them to have... Um, what, what Lenin talked about have a bourgeoisified level of existence, you know? So they have, you know, the paraphernalia, the nice cars and homes and all those things, but also the, um, the status that comes with a position of some kind, whether it's, as you say, you know, a university uh, uh, chancellor or a leader of a big trade union or, a, you know, uh, you know, worker in the in the city um you know these people form a, a network of support for the system and they also form an important role uh in the working class movement they tend to provide its leadership and they're the ones who make sure actually that the working class movement stays within boundaries which are acceptable to the ruling class. These are the leaders of the Labour Party and actually always have been, even when they looked very blue collar. The leaders of the Labour Party came from a section of the working class which was actually loyal to the system, which was privileged, privileged craft workers, you know, who had a special status above ordinary workers uh, and didn't want to fall into the mass. And their special status came from the super profits of imperialism, you know. And so imperialism has created this mechanism and kept it going for, you know, more than 100 years, whereby because it, brought, it, it, it loots wealth from so much of the world, it spends a portion of that wealth on keeping a section of the population well bribed, comfortable and loyal. You know, the very first Labour government in 1924, which the workers had really believed was going to usher in some radical changes and that, you know, we're going to find our way to socialism somehow. Um, Ramsay MacDonald was the prime minister of that government. And he said that his aim 
was to show that the Labour Party was a, a loyal force for the crown and that the empire would be safe in its hands. Literally his words, safe in our hands, the empire. So you see, nothing has really changed because what is Keir Starmer showing? What has he been showing? So that when he, when he is so subservient towards the Zionist lobby, as it seems, when he is so um, absolutely servile towards the, the needs of Israel, actually what he's doing is telling the imperialists, we are loyal to you. Your interests come first. Because Israel, Zionism, it's an imperialist project. It's there because the imperialists need it to be there. And support for Israel is absolutely unquestionable precisely because the ruling class, the British and American ruling classes need Israel to keep control of the Middle East. And so if you want to be allowed to anywhere near high office in Britain or the USA, you better be a Zionist. And that is what Keir Starmer has been showing us, just like Ramsay MacDonald was showing us in 1924. You're quiet. Sorry about that. I keep forgetting. Um, every now and then, that's the problem with muting yourself. Every now and then you forget. Now, there's another group of people. So in the U.S., we have this group. There's Bernie Sanders. There's... Uh, there's a uh, AOC, but Bernie is the leadership who uses, you know, some of the um, terms of socialism of the left. We need a revolutionary change, blah, blah, blah. And this is he's so angry. Look at this guy's book. It's OK. All right. Thanks to be angry at capitalism. This is Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders. Here's a guy who. Um, Recently, uh, he did a, so that's it. It's okay. I just want you to know that, uh, feel good about yourself, that you're a little miffed at capitalism. It's okay to be angry, not upset, not really pissed off, but just, you know, mildly angry at capitalism, right? And Bernie Sanders, uh, when the, uh, a week or two after the um, genocide started, um, he was asked about a ceasefire and he said, oh, no, we, how can we have a ceasefire when Hamas wants chaos and they want to destroy Israel and blah, blah, blah. We can't have a ceasefire. And APAC, the, the lobby here in the U.S., actually took that clip and put it up. And, I, and now I say Bernie Sanders' legacy in life is he's an advertisement for APAC. That's his legacy in life. Your thoughts on, and now we've got the Bernie Sanders, the AOCs, this, the people that use the rhetoric of, oh, yes, we want to be, um, we're democratic socialists, right? And uh, at one point when they, they were talking about the border and AOC said, what I get into, but just touched on it. She says, well, it's imperialism and we're destabilizing these countries over there and we need to stop doing that. Just very briefly, she made that statement and then she went back to the rhetoric of the empire. I see Bernie Sanders and AOC and people like that as my worst enemy. I see them as people who they're a fraud and they serve a very valuable purpose of creating the illusion that somewhere in this imperialist monster, somewhere in the Democratic Party, right, there is still left a hope that you can make something good out of it, that somewhere in the corners of it, that there's some part of this system that's salvageable when there ain't. At any rate, your thoughts on Bernie's, it's okay to be, and I love this, it's okay, not in the, not an imperative, it's okay to be a little fifth at capital. It's okay. I just want you to know, you've been studying Lenin for 30 years, and little did you know, did you read book, Lenin actually wrote a book that says, it's okay. To be a little missed at uh, imperialism. I don't recall that book, but I'm sure Bernie Sanders has a copy of it. At any rate, your, your thoughts. I think you summed it up beautifully yourself, darling. Um, you know, just this fact that they call themselves democratic socialist, like there's a different type, like all the other socialists are against democracy, immediately says that if, in fact, what they are is not socialists, right? 
they are self-identifying um, socialists. What they mean by socialism is capitalism with kinder char characteristics. And when you live in an imperialist country, what that actually means is do your imperialism in such a way where, number one, I don't feel guilty, and number two, the workers in our country get a better bribe. That's it. That's what they mean. Because there is no other thing to mean. Imperialism is not a foreign policy. Imperialism is an integrated world system of capitalism at a certain stage of its development, which it has reached. It reached it at the turn of the, of the 20th century, 125 years ago. It was being documentedly studied by people before Lenin. Lenin summed up and in a, in a Marxist way, the writings and investigations that had already been done by other economists on imperialism. Right? He didn't invent the term. He he pulled together all the writings in a really you know brilliant Marxist way and showed this is what imperialism is. This is how it's characterized. This is what it came out of. This is what comes after it. What comes after imperialism is revolution and socialism. There isn't a way to fix the fact that capitalism turned into imperialism. We can't go back to the days when capitalism was kind. Number one, they never existed. Number two, you know, you can't turn history backwards. Number three, if you managed it, where do you think you'd end up? If you went back 200 years, you're just asking to come back to where we are now. So the whole thing is a total fiction. It's a delusion. But more than that, it's, it's, it's spin and marketing. It's distraction for working people who are starting to wake up to these truths, that this system is intolerable, obscene, and not sustainable. And that we have to work out what to do about that. And really, these organizations like Democratic Socialists of America uh, are there to catch some of the people who are waking up and looking for answers and stop them finding the answer that the ruling class dreads us finding, which is in those books there, right? Which is what Lenin taught us, uh, that there we have to organize. It's not okay to be angry. <laughs> I mean, we are angry. Of course we're angry. Like, yes, you're angry about capitalism. So thank you. Bernie says I'm allowed to be. But He's giving you permission. I have put Bernie's permission to feel my pain, right? Well, but let me, can, I, can, can I add something else to it? Yeah, sure. You have permission to be angry. Okay. Whereas what I would say to people is that's an emotion. You, any, there's no such thing as, as we say in Zen, there's no such thing as a wrong emotion, right? There's, there's wrong actions. You could say, I hate that person. Well, that's a natural emotion. It would be wrong to try to injure them or hurt them or kill them, but the emotion is there. It's always okay to be angry. What I would say is this. It is a necessity that you act, right? This is saying it's okay to feel bad. Are you upset at the system? Yeah, they're they're committing a genocide. They're robbing us blind. They're treating us, you know, they're taking our tax money and doing terrible things with it. And I, I don't have decent schools, et cetera. This is terrible. Okay. You can feel bad about that. Now go back and vote for the Democrats, vote for labor, blah, blah, blah. But I've given you permission to feel bad. Where I would say, if you are truly angry and upset and you're starting to wake up, it is a necessity that you act. Here are some options. Let's talk about the options. Let's come together and see what we can do to act. That gives you a way to, what they, it's okay to be angry, gives you a way to vent. And then you get ushered right back into the system. You go outside and yell into a canyon, right? And then after you've yelled and got it all out, it's all right, do it, get it all out. Now come back in here and join the imperialists because we got countries we got to overthrow and people who desperately need their natural resources to be stolen. So you said a minute ago something that I think is really important for people to understand. You said, I feel like someone like Bernie Sanders and the AOC type brigade are my worst enemy. And that's absolutely right. The, the people who are obviously your class enemies are much more easy to identify than the people who claim to be on your side, but who are actually representing the interests of your class enemies under cover of being on your side, under cover of the words of socialism, they're helping imperialism to maintain its rule. And that is exactly the role that Jeremy Corbyn or Keir Starmer or Tony Blair or Ramsay McDonald's Labour Party plays. 
that's exactly the role that um, you know the the Democratic Party in the USA plays, whether it's under Joe Biden or represented by AOC or, or Bernie Sanders. Yes. It's the same party. It's the same institution. It's the same set of policies, actually. It's the same subservience to the ruling class and the ruling class's imperialist system and defense of their ability to loot the world before anything else. Because that's what the privilege of these people rests on. That's what they're being paid for, fundamentally. They're being paid to mislead, confuse, divert, divide the working class and stop it from organizing, as you said. You said we've got to act if we see that things are wrong. We not just not just be angry, but act. You're absolutely right. You know, the the lessons we get from Lenin are not just theory about understanding uh, our enemy, but the um, the lessons of how the working class creates unity and organization. Unity of action through organization is our secret power. But first you have to be organized. You can't have unity of action if you're not organized. And one of the ways we can see that the ruling class has understood this danger to them much better than the workers have understood because they've been, you know, divided in so many ways and they've been saturated with such, such false consciousness and such um, so much individualism and such a sense of isolation and, 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 and a breakdown in the mentality of, of class. Um, but the ruling class understands that their biggest threat comes from organized masses of workers. And one of the ways you can see that they understand this is the number of fake organizations they create, essentially. There's even a myriad of fake Leninist organizations. They call themselves Trotskyist. Anyone who calls himself a Trotskyist is basically faking Leninism on behalf of the ruling class to divide and confuse the working class. And there's a myriad Trotskyite organizations in all the Western countries. And they, have, they, cr they create a Trotskyite organization for almost every bit of the population, you know, with a slightly different focus, but essentially the same role. And it's to, to confuse the working class about what socialism really is and what it looks like. Um, and then in the meantime, we have this, we have this big, that's to kind of catch the ones who were wanting something more revolutionary than what they get from the Labour Party or the Democratic Party, right? So the, you've got your two options. You can go for a very revolutionary sounding, but ult ultimately pro-imperialist Trotskyists, or you can go for the ones who say, well, we're big and we do unity. We want unity. We want unity. The you know, all of the so so self-identifying socialists around the Democratic Party say, we've got to st stick with the Democrats because we need unity. We need unity. We need big numbers, don't we? That's what they do to us in the Labour Party too. We need unity. Working class needs unity. Now, this is a principle we have from, from Marxism, from Lenin, right? From the experience of the building of the Bolshevik Party, how to forge organizational unity was something very, very important because that's how you win. But there's a question when it comes to unity that these, this is a concept which is massively abused by people in all these organizations because, of course, unity with whom and for what? Now, if somebody is asking you to unify with those who are actually representing your class enemy, what they're asking you to do is to become useless, to stop saying things that will upset the status quo and to tie all of your organizational power to the class that you're supposed to be organizing to overthrow. Obviously, if you stop and think about that, that can't be right. right. So when you yeah. live in an imperialist country and you're talking about unity, you have to think very clearly, who can I, who do I want to unify with? Now, of course, we want to unify the mass of the poor working class. But if you want to know about who our allies are, our allies are the masses of the people in all the oppressed countries who are being attacked by our ruling class. Our allies are not the people in our own country who represent and shill for and defend the interests of our ruling class. Of course they're not. They, they're, the, they're the people we've got to overcome in order to, to, to move things forwards. But um, these people, you know, hide behind what is the socialist concept, you know, the need for working class unity to try to shut up the people who might actually start to make a change and a difference.
It seems to me I you often use the the pie metaphor, wherein um, what it seems to me is these people argue in this country there's a big pie, right? And we got to get our share of the pie, right? So the military industrial classes gets theirs, and Wall Street's going to get theirs, which just says let's accept that. Number one, let's accept that. Number two, the workers and the average people, they, we got to get our share of the pie, whatever that is. We need what are the you know, health care coverage or something, right? So it's there's this pie. Let's accept the existence of the pie and make sure our job as the so-called left is to make sure that the working class get their share of the pie. We don't want to question what's in the pie and how it was baked. We open the pie and there's all the bodies of people in Africa there's, oh, just, oh, there you go. I just wrote that down. What is the pie and how was it baked? Right. We open the pie. There's the bodies of people in Africa. There's bodies of people in, in the Muslim community that we stole their oil, blah, blah, blah. Right. How was the pie, the, the pie cooked? Oh, well, we went and bombed and murdered and slaughtered people. And, and so the pie was baked through murder. So we do not talk about the imperialism. The, the who's the chef of the pie? It's sure ain't us. We don't have any input on, on how the pie. And in the bottom line, when it comes down to it, all we end up doing is, in this pie metaphor, is accepting that Wall Street, the military industrial class, class etc., that the ruling class is going to bake the pie through evil machinations. They're going to eat the pie. And if we're lucky, we'll have a few crumbs left. Because ultimately, we say we want a, a, a perfect example. We why is it that in in the U.S. why is it that the government has has mandated that when the government buys medications from these companies in America, literally, the U.S. government is forbidden from bargaining the lowest price they can get from from big pharma. They just got to pay whatever they ask, right? So um, the Bernie Sanders and the people went, oh, this is unreal. So out of all of the many tens of thousands of medications that they buy, the Democrats said, we're going to, okay, you know, we're on top of this. We will now bargain the prices of six medications. Six, six out of tens of thousands. And then Bernie and the people were like, see, we have they're now bargaining, blah, 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 blah. So it's, when, when they finish the pie, if there is a crumb left, we'll let you look at it. You're not really even going to get to eat the crumb, but you'll get to look at the crumb. You can smell it. You can see how delicious it was. You can maybe ask the ruling class, was it yummy? And they can say, yeah, you still ain't getting none of the pie. But you can't have a discussion. Those of us who come and say, can we have a discussion about the pie, the history of the pie, what's in it? How? No, 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 except the pie. And in the end, you can look at the crumbs. You ain't even getting any of those. And that's kind of their job. I think I went a little too far with the pie metaphor, but I think I made my point, Jody. I love your pie metaphor. <laughs> um, and you're absolutely right. You know, it, essentially, it's a it's a, a very, um, oh, God, sorry. I, my brain is losing all the important words today. Um, it's a very sta static, immutable way of looking at the world. But, of course, the world, history, like, you know, it's, it's natural for people who were born into a world to look at it and go, this is just what the world is like. Because I wasn't alive before it was different than this. <laughs> but one of the great things about education and knowledge is you can find out that, in fact, everything is always changing. And the world is in a process and society is in a process of development. And things are not static. Things change. So as soon as you understand, oh, things change, then really important questions are, how did we get to where we are and where are we going? Right. And it's not just this is how it is. This is reality. And, and it's just it's like fixed for all time. You know, like the, 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 the sort of biblical, um, you know, um, I can't think of the bloody words. <laughs> There's a, there's a word in philosophy for things that uh, don't move, but I've forgotten it. Anyway, this idea where, um, you know, things just, they are how they are. And, you know, this is, uh, 
tables came into the world like this. Nobody invented tables. You know, they just, they've always existed. And isn't this is what table is like. And God made everything in six days and he put it down. And it's basically been the same ever since. And anything, you know, they used to genuinely have these questions 200 years ago when they found fossils in the cliffs and say, uh, well, God just put those there. You know? Yeah, and I've heard that Satan, I've heard, also heard that there, that the devil put those there to fool us, to make us believe that there was dinosaurs once, you know. Yeah, right. So there's, you know, there's this, um, uh, very static view of how things are and then there's what science has taught us right which is that things are in development in motion that there's a history to the planet to the universe to human civilization uh to everything and when we want to understand society uh, we have to understand its development and once we start to understand that we can also understand that the conditions that led us here are also creating the elements of something that goes beyond the society we're in now. That although we have only ever experienced this type of society because that's when we were born, there used to be different types of society. And in the future, there will be different types of society. That's a really important, important point to grasp. This is not some kind of dreaming, imagining. This is a, this is a practical scientific truth. It's verifiable reality. And once you understand that and you study, you start to realize, OK, so there's a lot of things that don't work about how society is now. Why are they not working? Oh, it turns out that one of the reasons so many things don't work is because capitalism has really, in fact, quite a long time ago now, in terms of human lifetimes, in terms of history, you could say, well, it's not that long, but in terms of human lifetimes, it's forever, right? Capitalism really reached an end point once it hit monopoly capitalism and conquered the whole globe because now there's no way to expand out of your crises. So your crises get deeper and deeper and deeper. And the only way out is to destroy insane numbers of people, insane amounts of produced goods, insane amounts of infrastructure and stored wealth in order to kickstart your economy and try to limp along for another 20, 30 years before there's another world war. You know, this is what capitalism has brought us to. Capitalism in its early days created some marvelous, amazing things. Capitalism was a, a, a stage in the development of human civilization. It's the stage which is over in terms of anything useful it has to offer to humanity. Uh, and what it has done is create a modern working class and it's created modern means of production. Now, when you put those two things together without the ruling class that controls them today, without the need for production to produce a profit. When you just put, when you get rid of that ruling class, that's the revolution part, then you build a planned economy, that's the socialism part. All it means is you're putting together what capitalism built in a way that's logical, that makes sense for human beings, whereby instead of the rich getting richer and richer and richer and pulling all of the wealth into the, into one massive pile while the rest of the population of the planet gets poorer and poorer and poorer and has to be literally genocided to accept their place on the bottom, right? Endlessly genocided, not just in Palestine, is it? I mean, the 20th and 19th centuries are one long history of bloody genocides to keep people in their place so the rich can keep sucking up the wealth, right? When we don't have that imperative to, to produce capital, for, for, for means of production to function as capital that is just making wealth piles get, get bigger, when we have means of production, which are simply means of production, ways to make stuff and people who need stuff, and we can put those things together and say, well, we've got workers, and we've got, we've got raw materials, we've got the land, we've got the sky, we've got the seas, we've got these factories, we've got all this technology. We can put together the people and the things that they need and the labor they're able to carry out and all of these machines and all of these things, and we can produce what we need. We can decide what we need to produce and produce it and, and distribute it to one another so that we've got all we need. And on that basis, without the need for profit, harnessing the labor power of everybody, which capitalism can't do. Capitalism keeps a huge number of people unemployed because it can't use them to make a profit out of. And because actually it's necessary condition of capitalist production to have unemployed people because it keeps the price of wages down. And that's the necessary condition of making a good profit. Right. So on every front, the capitalist system is anti-human and it, 
inequality is baked into it, not just like, oh, that guy next door to me has got a bigger house, but like five people in the world have as much wealth as three and a half billion put together. That type of inequality, and it's only getting more so. I think you're, uh, you know, I think you're 100 percent on. And uh, last thing, if you got a minute, um, a couple minutes, um, your thoughts on the whole and we'll, we'll end with that because I know we both have things to do. Um, your thoughts with on uh, Macron and, uh, you know, the German leak and the freak out that we're getting from the ruling elite in Europe, the recognition that once again, they have knocked on the door of uh the russians they've gone to their um you know the imperialists have shown up on the doorstep of russia again we're going to take russia down and uh once again they've fallen short and uh you know they came up with all kinds of uh you know um uh, propaganda about how russia was going to lose and blah 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 they were clearly they were going to win they thought capital alone we've got more money another 10 billion going to russia that somehow money could defeat artillery that that could defeat defeat people they were they were like if we just give another 50 billion another 100 billion as though that's going to do any good because in their minds money equals victory money equals power so no matter how bad ukraine's losing if we just give them more money that's so much more power they'll win and what we're seeing in Russia is, again, the legacy of the Soviet Union. Russia says, OK, we're going to turn our factories up. We're going to put our people in. We're going to make more shelves. We're going to do things in the physical world as opposed to just this fictitious capital. I mean, the U.S. just says we'll print another 80 billion and send it there. It's fictitious, fictitious capital. The 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 legacy of the Soviet Union says say to our people, we're being attacked. We need to come together. Can you work extra time in the factory? And everybody will go into the factory and make shelves and we'll, we'll win. The freak out of Macron saying, we'll go take the Russians on ourselves, the French, as if they haven't tried that before, to no avail. Your thoughts on this delusion of these leaders, when they even admit that one of them literally said, yeah, if we got in a fight with Russians after day one, we'd be throwing stones. We're out of where they literally said we would be throwing rocks at them after one day of fighting because we don't have any ammunition at all, even to give to Ukraine. But still, they're deluding themselves into, yeah, maybe we might have to go in and knock the Ruskies out once and for all. First of all, I have to apologize because there's some people doing work outside my house. And oh, no. They came back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, very quickly, I just want to say. It's not quite fictitious capital when these guys print 80 billion. What's happening is they're diluting their own currencies very rapidly by, by printing money on such a large scale, they are devaluing it. But still each dollar has a value, it's just less of a value than it was yesterday before that 80 billion was printed, right? So it has purchasing power in the world, but what's happening is all around the world, we're seeing massive inflation because the US dollar is the reserve currency of the world and they're exporting their inflation. They're not just experiencing it in their home economy, it's affecting the entire globe's economy. So that was just one thing. Um, we are seeing in the war between NATO and Russia in Ukraine, the effect of a century and a half of the export of capital. Export of capital is the practice of imperialism. When the first capitalist countries the capitalists there had concentrated uh, the wealth of their own countries into a few hands to the extent that the home market and demand in the home market had really fallen off in order to keep making profits. And in order to maximize profits, they start exporting capital. And instead of where they used to, where they used to sell goods to the world, you know, Britain in the early days of capitalism was the workshop of the world. We made everything and we sold it to people everywhere. <clears throat> then the next stage, monopoly capitalist stage, the imperialist stage is you get better profits by exporting your production to somewhere else. So you take your capital, you set up production where workers, land, you know, standards of living for the working class is lower, land is cheaper, everything is cheaper. And so when you're making your product, your profit is much higher. This is what we call super profits. That's how imperialism works. And those super profits are then brought back, repatriated home to where the capital came from. That's the fundamental workings of the imperialist system. 
But the thing is, 120, 30, 40, 50 years of that process, what we're seeing is the total hollowing out now of the home economies and the weakness that leaves at the heart of the system, whereby things they rely on to go to war, and war is so intrinsic to their system, they are getting from elsewhere. And that all relies on their ability to dominate everybody and command everybody to do as they're told. It works fine if you're the only player in town, if there's no power big enough to stand up for you. The problem is that since 1917, there have been powers capable of standing up to imperialism. And the USA thought that those days were over when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. And all of the imperialist countries which had maintained some level of fighting power and technological power, you know, certain key industries they kept at home because they thought they needed to for their security if they came to a fight against the USSR, they went, ah, well, we don't have to pay for that rubbish anymore because there's no USSR to fight. And all the people we're fighting now, we just bomb them from the air and they can't hit us back. So the need to prepare for the type of war you fight against the peer competitor, they let go of that. And they have allowed the massive acceleration of the outsourcing of all industry. Now, this was a process, like I said, it's a long ongoing process. It didn't just start in 1991, but it's definitely been accelerating, you know, as the crisis of the global capitalist system uh, reset in after World War II in the late 60s, early 70s, actually, you can look back at that socially and you, you know that's right because you start to see the social decay, you know, the post-war consensus, the, the post-war boom, when there was lots and lots of building going on all over Europe and America was benefiting as much as the Europeans were and war from all the building that was going on around the world to reconstruct what had been destroyed after World War II. Um, the Americans were in every bit of that in, in Europe, weren't they? And there, of course, they had been uh, sending munitions to the world during World War II. And then afterwards, they turned their munitions factories into fertilizer factories. And we got our green revolution in Europe right? and all over the world, in fact, which is everybody must now farm on this model and take nitrates from the USA. So one way or another, the USA had a lot of uh, booming industry on its own soil. But this process of you know, outsourcing everything in the name of, of, of keeping profits up because you get more profit from doing your production abroad. It only works when none of the countries you're doing your, your activities in are sovereign. When they don't start standing up for themselves and saying, well, you know, the resources you're using over here, actually, they belong to us. And we might decide how we're going to use them, you know. And when no other country can come along and offer those countries you're trampling all over better terms for doing trade, actually doing trade as opposed to just being ripped off. And of course, the rise of China and the, and the um, rehabilitation, if you like, of Russia have shifted all of that massively. And so increasingly countries are finding that there's an alternative to just being on their knees um, under the heel of the US empire. And um, the ability of Russia and China to stand up for themselves, we've talked about this before, is totally rooted in the fact of their socialist revolutions. You know, um, the, the achievements of the planned economy refuse to die. You know, a long time after the planned economy was abolished, in uh, in uh, Russia, Russia. For first it was it was sort of gradually being undermined for several decades during Soviet times, and then it was totally abolished, and they got shock therapy in Russia. But actually, if you look now, you know, you gave me last week some some speeches to look at by, by President Putin and by Sergei Lavrov, and in President Putin's speech, it's very noticeable how many things they're talking not about building from scratch, but from renovating. How much infrastructure they're still using that's from the Soviet period. And people are complaining it hasn't been looked after. Right. And he's saying, right, we're going to look after it. We're going to bring it back. We're going to modernize it. We're going to put money into renovating it and, and repairing it and, you know, re, re, revitalizing it. 
but that framework is still there. You know, huge numbers of whether it's scientific institutes or kindergartens or medical centers, you know, universities. You know, he's talking about, you know, we've got to revamp our kindergartens. We've got to revamp the, the dormitories of our universities. Um, he also talked about building new ones. But, you know, it's very clear that there's a huge infrastructure on the soil of, of modern Russia, which is a legacy of socialist planning and socialist construction. And of course, the, the, the feats that were achieved in those days came about precisely because they no longer had to serve the God of profit. You're yeah, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I agree with you. Um, all right. Well, we got to get ready to run. But I would like, uh, you know, uh, if you get a chance, if you have a chance, we need to talk. I would like to do a show where we review those two speeches. I'd like to. I've said it before, but I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you some information where we go over. I've highlighted some passages that I want to uh, ask you about. I think they're critical. So we'll we'll see what your schedule looks like, and we'll we'll do that as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Jody Broad. Where can people find you and your organization online? So uh, my party website is down here, thecommunists.org. Uh, you can find the communists, our channel on Telegram, and me, Jody Bra, on Telegram. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, and so is my party. And um, we have a YouTube channel called Proletarian TV. Thank you, everyone. You see every everything uh, scrolling across the bottom. Take a look at that. Make sure you share this on all your social media platforms and hit the like button. Thank you.